sound a little fun about that outrageous thing we're going to discuss today, can't you? Yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> this hearing will come to order. Good morning. I'd like to welcome everyone to today's hearing of the science of the, of the House Committee on Science and Technology entitled Geoengineering, Assessing the Implications of Large-Scale Climate Intervention. I believe this hearing marks the first time that a congressional committee has undertaken a serious review of proposals for climate engineering. That is not surprising because this is a very complex, controversial subject that has had little formal debate in the United States. Geoengineering carries with it a tremendous range of uncertainties, ethical and political concerns, and the potential for catastrophic environmental side effects. But we're faced with the stark reality that the climate is changing and that the onset of impacts may outpace the world's political and economic ability to avoid them. Therefore, we should accept the possibility that certain climate engineering proposals may merit consideration and, as a starting point, review research and development as appropriate. At this time, uh, or rather, it is uh, best to, uh, uh, it is best geoengineering, or at its best, geoengineering might only buy us some time. Uh, but if we want to know the answers, we have to begin to ask the tough questions. Today, we begin what I believe will be a long conversation. In fact, my intention is for this hearing to serve as the introduction to the concept of geo, or rather, of climate engineering. Over the next eight months, the committee will hold two or three more hearings to explore underlying science, engineering, and ethical, economic, and governance concerns in fuller detail. I'm pleased to announce that this will be part of an interparliamentary project uh, with our counterpart in the United Kingdom House of Commons Science and Technology Committee. Uh, when members of the Commons Committee visited us last spring, the chairman, Phil Willis, proposed that we work together on issues of common interest. Geoengineering has decidedly global implications and research should be considered in the context of transparent international process. Yesterday, the Commons Committee voted to undertake a parallel effort to examine the domestic and international regulatory framework that may be applicable to geoengineering. We will be in close contact with them, sharing the findings from our own efforts. When they complete their work in the spring, the chairman of the committee uh, will testify before us in a hearing on domestic and international governance issues. But before we begin this discussion today, I want to make something very clear up front. My decision to hold this hearing should not in any way be misconstrued as an endorsement of any geoengineering activity, and the timing has nothing to do with the pending negotiations in Copenhagen. I know we will run the risk of misleading headlines. However, this subject requires very careful examination and will likely only be considered as a potential stopgap tool in a much wider package of climate change mitigation and adaptation strategies. It will require years of international coordinated research for us to better understand our options, to examine the impacts, and to know if any activity warrants a deployment. In the meantime, nothing should stop us from pursuing aggressive long-term domestic and global strategies for achieving deep reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. This issue is too important for us to keep our heads in the sand. We must get ahead of geoengineering before it gets ahead of us, or worse, before we find ourselves in a climate emergency with inadequate information as to the full range of options. As chairman of the Committee of Jurisdiction, I feel a responsibility to begin a public dialogue and develop a record on geoengineering. And with that, I look forward to a, to a good, healthy uh, discussion, and I turn it over to my distinguished ranking member, uh, Mr. Hall, for his opening statement. Mr. Chairman, I could make the shortest opening stage speech in, in history of this committee. Okay. I could say, geoengineering, hello. <laughs> but I won't do that. Uh, I, I will just say to you that I, I think I thank you for having this, uh, holding this hearing today. And once again, the commerce in this committee uh, in our duties are taking issues and taking on issues that are really the forefront of cutting edge science and I appreciate your leadership. Uh, as many of my colleagues will agree, the debate about climate change is far from over. I'm sure that you conducted and participated in that and came to the conclusion that there was a fact that there's still many, many opinions as to the causes, the effects and the potential solutions. 
demonstrates how much uncertainty there is out there and how crucial it is for our nation to continue to search for answers. Uh, geoengineering or climate engineering is in, I guess, the intentional modification of the Earth's environment to promote uh, habitat, to promote and the, just go to the definition and see that it's so broad that uh, uh, you could apply the term to almost any human changes that, that are made by humans in their surrounding environment, uh, from building dams to deforestation. Uh, the actions are, are more local or regional in scope. The types of uh, modifications we'll be discussing this morning are global in nature, and therefore, no matter what our preconceptions are, the implications of such technologies are far from reaching and, and are far-reaching. Uh, I understand that the hearing is to be the first of a series of hearings on this topic, further exploring the scientific basis underpinning the concept of geoengineering and the ethical concerns and issues surrounding any future development and deployment scenarios could be extremely helpful in advancing the uh, discussion about geoengineering. I'll reserve my full judgment on this issue until all the facts are in, but I have to admit that I'm a bit skeptical about this non-traditional approach. Uh, I know that uh, our witnesses uh, here today represent a variety of different viewpoints on geoengineering, and I'm eager to listen to their thoughts about the issue. I'm sure that we'll have plenty of questions to ask them, and I really look forward to a very lively discussion. I expect we're going to have one. And so I think I, I have to thank you again, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this kind of opens up, you know, uh, Alfred Hitchcock did The Bird. You remember that movie? And I've been working all since that time on a movie to have the elephants, the flying elephants, you know, like Hitchcock had those birds that were going to disturb the whole world. And uh, I don't know if I can get that underway or not, but we we maybe work that in in some of this year. But I'll yield back to my chairman, James Bond, and I thank you very much for letting me talk. Well, Professor Shepard, welcome to America. <laughs> if there are other members uh, who I wish... I knew that'd get me in trouble. <laughs> if there are other members who wish to submit additional opening statements, uh, your statements will be added to the record at this point. And now it's my pleasure to, uh, uh, to introduce our witnesses. Uh, professor John Shepard is a professor, uh, professional research fellow in Earth System Science at the University of Southampton and chair of the Royal Society uh, Geoengineering Working Group that produced the report Geoengineering, the Climate, Science, and Governance uh, Uncertainty. And the University of Southampton is not located uh, in New York. Um, <laughs> Dr. Uh, Ken Calera is a professor of environmental science in the Department of, uh, of Global Ecology at the Carnegie Institute of Washington and co-author of the Royal um, uh, Society report. Dr. Lee Lane is the co-director of the American Enterprise Institute for Public Policy Research uh, and uh, Geoengineering Project. And Dr. Dr. Alan Robach is a professor at the Department of Environmental Science and at the School of Environmental and Biological Sciences at Rutgers University. Dr. Robach, uh, uh, Mr. Rothman wanted us to give you his best. He is ill today. Uh, but wanted to, uh, to be with you. And Dr. James Fleming is Professor and Director of the Science, Technology, and Society Department at Colby uh, College and the author of Fixing the Sky, The Checkered History of Weather and Climate Control. As our witnesses should know, we will have five minutes for your spoken testimony. Your written testimony will be included in the record for the hearing. And when you have completed your spoken testimony, we will begin the questions. Each member uh, then will have... Uh, five minutes to question the witnesses. So we begin in the order. Uh, Dr. Uh, um, uh, Calerda. Caldera, excuse me. Yes, sir. Well, uh, I'm reading from my, my uh, report here, and uh, uh, so you are first in that regard. But if you'd like to yield to Dr. Shepard, then uh, we will do that. Okay, so, so if you'd turn on your mic, then we'll all be better off. Chairman Gordon, Ranking Member Hall, members of the committee, I thank you for giving me the opportunity today to speak with you about why it makes sense for us as American taxpayers to invest some of our hard-earned dollars 
in exploring ways to cost-effectively reduce environmental threats that are facing us. I'm a climate scientist working at the Carnegie Institution Department of Global Ecology. I've been studying climate and ocean acidification for over 20 years and, and investigating geoengineering options for more than 10 years. Climate change poses a real risk to Americans. The surest way to reduce this risk is to reduce emissions of greenhouse gases such as carbon dioxide. We can build a 21st century energy system based on solar and nuclear power, along with carbon capture and storage from coal, oil, and gas-fired power plants. I believe we can and will make this transformation to the clean energy system of the future. However, even if we decide to start building our 21st century energy system today, because of the long time lags involved, we will still face threats from climate change. The options we're discussing today can be divided into two categories with very different characteristics, solar radiation management approaches and carbon dioxide removal approaches. Solar radiation management methods, which you could also call sunlight reflection methods, seek to reduce the amount of climate change by reflecting some of the sun's warming rays back to space. We know this basically works because volcanoes have cooled the earth in this way. Preliminary research suggests that we could rapidly and relatively cheaply put tiny particles high in the stratosphere and that this would cause the Earth to cool quickly. Nobody thinks these approaches will perfectly offset effects of carbon dioxide. For example, these methods do not address the problem of ocean acidification. However, preliminary climate model simulations indicate that these approaches could offset most climate change in most places most of the time. While these approaches may be able to reduce overall risk, they could and likely will introduce new environmental and political risks. In contrast, carbon dioxide removal approaches seek to reduce the amount of climate change and ocean acidification by removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Essentially, these options reverse carbon dioxide emissions into the atmosphere by pulling carbon dioxide back out of the atmosphere. There are two basic types of carbon dioxide removal methods. One is to use growing forests or other plants to store carbon in organic forms. The other is to use chemical techniques. We could build centralized carbon dioxide removal factories or perhaps spread out finely ground up minerals that would remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. With the exception of proposals to fertilize the oceans, carbon dioxide removal methods are unlikely to introduce new unprecedented risks, so cost is likely to be the primary consideration governing deployment. Let me mention in closing that I do not think the term geoengineering is very useful in informed discussions. The term has been used by so many people to refer to so many different and poorly defined grab bags of distantly related things that I do not believe the term can help us to think clearly about the decisions we need to make. So to conclude, we need multi-agency research programs in both sunlight reflection methods and carbon dioxide removal approaches to find cost-effective ways to protect American taxpayers from unnecessary environmental risk. Because these two basic approaches, the solar radiation management approaches and the carbon dioxide removal approaches, differ in so many dimensions, it seems unwise to link these research programs closely together. Solving our climate change problem is largely about cost-effective risk management. There are many different ways that risk might be diminished, and the most important of these is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. However, we also need to improve our resilience so that we can better adapt to the climate change that does occur. We also need to understand whether there are ways that we can cost-effectively remove carbon dioxide and perhaps other greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. Lastly, we should try to understand whether thoughtful, intentional interventions into the climate system might be able to undo some of the damage that we are doing with our current inadvertent intervention. The problem is too serious to allow prejudice to take options off of the table. I thank you for your attention, and I would be happy to answer your questions. Thank you, Dr. Cadero. And uh, Professor Shepard, you recognize. 
Uh, good morning, uh, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member, members of the committee, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for the invitation to come and uh, testify to you this morning. Um, it's a privilege to have that opportunity. And my testimony will be largely based on the uh, Royal Society study that um, you mentioned, Mr. Chairman, uh, which was undertaken over the past year uh, and which I chaired. Uh, the report of this study was published in September and it's available on the Royal Society's website and printed copies uh, have been made available to the committee. Um, the aim of this study was really to try and produce an authoritative and wide-ranging review to reduce the confusion and misinformation which exists uh, in some quarters about this rather controversial and novel issue. Uh, in order to enable a well-informed debate on the subject. And so it's uh, a great pleasure to me to be here at the beginning of uh, such a debate, and I hope that our work will be useful. Uh, the working group was composed of uh, 12 members, mainly scientists and engineers from the UK, but also included a sociologist, a lawyer, and an economist, and one member from the USA, Dr. Caldera on my left, and one from Canada. And the members of the group were not proponents of geoengineering. They reflected a very wide range of opinions on the subject and all recognize that the primary uh, goal is to make the transition to the low carbon economy that Dr. Caldera has already mentioned, which we shall need to do eventually irrespective of climate change, simply because fossil fuels are a finite resource. So our terms of reference were to consider and, so far as possible, to evaluate proposed schemes for geoengineering, uh, which we took to mean the deliberate large-scale intervention in the Earth's climate system, primarily in order to moderate global warming. And the study was based primarily on a review of the literature, uh, but also by a call for submissions of evidence, of which we received some 75. Uh, since time is short, I would like to move directly to summarize the key messages uh, of our study. And first among these is that geoengineering is not a magic bullet. Uh, none of the methods that have been proposed provide an easy or immediate solution to the problems of climate change. There is a, a great deal of uncertainty about various aspects of virtually all the schemes that are being discussed. So, at present, this technology, in whatever form it takes, is not an alternative to emissions reductions, which remain the safest and most predictable method of moderating climate change. And in our view, cutting global emissions of greenhouse gases must remain our highest priority. However, we all recognize that this is proving to be difficult, and in the future, given adequate research, geoengineering may be useful to support the efforts to mitigate climate change by conventional means. Uh, we concluded that geoengineering is very likely to be technical, technically possible, but there are major uncertainties uh, and risks with all methods concerning not only their effectiveness, but also their costs, uh, their unintended environmental impacts, and the social consequences and mechanisms needed to uh, manage them. So in our view, this is not a technology which is ready for deployment in the immediate future. It is, however, a technology that may be useful at some point in the future if we find that we have need of it, but it will not be available unless we undertake the necessary research, not only on the technology, but particularly also on the environmental and social impacts of such uh, proposals. And to do that, we need to have a widespread public debate uh, and widespread public engagement, and especially to develop an acceptable system of governance. Uh, geoengineering, by intention, will affect everybody on the planet because it is an intentional moderation of the environment, and consequently everybody has an interest in the outcome. And we need to find a way to engage the opinions of a very diverse group of people uh, on the planet in order that this can be done in an orderly and uh, acceptable manner. Dr. Caldera has reviewed the major differences between some of the methods, which uh, I support entirely, 
And I would say finally that too little is known about the technologies at this stage to pick a winner. What we need is research on a small portfolio of promising techniques of both major types uh, in order that our plan B will be well prepared should we ever need it. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Shepard. And now, Mr. Lane, you're recognized. Uh, Chairman Gordon, Ranking Member Hall, other members of the committee, thank you very much for the opportunity to appear here this morning. Um, I'm Lee Lane. I'm uh, a resident fellow and uh, head of the AEI Geoengineering Project. The American Enterprise Institute uh, is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that engages in research and education on issues of public policy. AEI does not take organizational stances on the issues that it studies, and the views that I'm going to express here this morning are entirely my own. I want to begin by warmly commending the committee for convening this hearing. And my statement fundamentally urges that you treat uh, this session as a first step toward embarking upon a serious, uh, sustained, and systematic exploration uh, by the U.S. government of research and development into solar radiation management in particular, one of the two approaches to climate engineering discussed by Dr. Caldera and Dr. Shepard. Solar radiation management, or SRM, uh, as the committee has heard, envisions offsetting man-made global warming by slightly raising the amount of sunlight that the Earth reflects back into space. In a recent study, a panel of five highly acclaimed economists, including three Nobel laureates, rated R&D on solar radiation management concepts two solar radiation management concepts as the first and third most productive kinds of investment that can be made in dealing with climate change. Now, the panel that did those rankings was well aware of the large uncertainties that continue to surround solar radiation management, and they were also aware of the fact that in the long run, at least, solar radiation management cannot replace the need for greenhouse gas emissions reductions. But at the same time, the panel was very much, clearly very much aware of the vast potential that solar radiation management has. Uh, one preliminary assessment is that SRM, if deployed, might well produce savings in terms of reduced damages from climate change uh, in terms of 200 to 700 billion dollars a year. So those are, we have potentially a good deal of upside with this technology. The cost of an R&D effort into solar radiation management is likely to be minuscule in comparison with these potential benefits. SRM research is needed in part because, for many nations, steep reductions in greenhouse gas emissions cost more than the perceived value of the benefits of making those reductions. The record of the last 20 years of climate talks amply demonstrates that the prospects for steep emissions reductions on a global scale are poor, and they're likely to remain so for an extended period of time. Yet without such emissions reductions, and perhaps even with them, some risk exists that quite harmful climate change might occur. An SRM system might greatly reduce the potential for harm. SRM, it is true, carries some hazards of its own. An R&D program, though, provides the best chance of gaining the information that might be needed both to assess the prospects of SRM in a more knowledgeable way and also perhaps to find ways of minimizing those risks in the future. At this point, the top priority 
should be to gain added knowledge about SRM. Eventually, the U.S. may wish to uh, address questions of international governance, but at this point, our first goal should be to learn more about climate, uh, about solar radiation management as a tool. I guess the single most important caution that I would like to leave with the committee is that the governance arrangements for any research program, including one on solar radiation management, can either serve to uh, nurture R&D success or they can serve to stifle it. And I think it's awfully important as we go forward in considering how we want to manage research and development into SRM that we keep in mind the need to balance the risks and the, the benefits of how we structure our R&D efforts. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Lane. Also, thank you for being an early supporter of ARPA-E. We hope that, um, that some of the research that will come out of ARPA-E will mean that uh, this um, potential uh, review will be moot. I hope so, too. <laughs> uh, Dr. Robach, um, uh, you're, uh, we welcome your discussion. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Hall, members of the committee, thank you for inviting me. First, I'd like to agree with Ken Caldera that global warming is a serious problem and that mitigation, reduction of emissions, should be our primary response. We also need to do adaptation and learn to live with some of the climate change, which is going to happen no matter what. Using geoengineering should only be in event of a planetary emergency and only for a temporary period of time, and it's not a solution to global warming. Uh, could I have the first slide? Uh, I've done climate, I've, I've d a climatologist. I've done climate research and effects on, of volcanic eruptions for 35 years. We did a climate model simulation of what would happen if we put in the equivalent of one Pinatubo volcanic eruption every four years. That's the the green line is the global warming temperatures that we've seen up until now. The black line is one Pinatubo every four years. The brown line is one Pinatubo every two years, assuming that you could do it. This brings up several questions. What temperature do we want the planet to be? Do we want it to stay constant? Do we want it to be at 1980 levels? Do we want it at 1880 levels? And who decides? What if Russia want, and Canada want a little bit warmer and India wants a little bit cooler? If we stopped after 20 years, we'd have rapid warming, as you can see. We did it for 20 years. And this rapid climate change would be much more dangerous than the gradual change we would get without doing anything. So this is a couple of the reasons why I'm concerned about it. But we certainly need more research. Now, how do we get the aerosols? I'm talking about the solar radiation management. How do we get the aerosols into the stratosphere? There's no way to do it today. Ideas of artillery or balloons or airplanes need a lot of research. Uh, Ken said it would be easy and cheap, but there's no demonstration of that. It might not be that expensive, but th such equipment just doesn't exist today. So uh, I've made a list of uh, seven reasons why it, it benefits for stratosphere geoengineering and 17 reasons why it might be a bad idea. Uh, now. Uh, volcanic eruptions produce drought in Africa and Asia. They produce ozone depletion, uh, no more blue skies, less solar power. And each of these needs to be quantified so you policymakers can make a decision about whether or not to implement it. We don't have quantification of any of these yet. I disagree with the eco economic analysis because they just ignored many of the risks and didn't even count what the possible dangers might be. So, but I agree with everybody that we need a research program so we can quantify each of these so policymakers can tell if, is there a plan B in your pocket or is it empty? We really need to know that and we don't know the answer to that yet. Uh, if we were going to test uh, putting particles in the stratosphere, we don't have a system to observe them. The U.S. used to have a series of satellites called SAGE which looked at particles in the stratosphere. It was very useful for monitoring volcanic eruptions. And they they stopped working, and there's no plan to put them up there. So we need this system anyway to monitor the stratosphere for the next volcanic eruption and to monitor it if we ex ever do experimentation. 
if we wanted to do experimentation, it would, uh, it, it's not possible to do just a small scale test, put a little bit of particles in and see what would happen. We could do that, but we couldn't measure their effects because there's a lot of weather variability, a lot of weather noise. And so we'd really have to put a lot of material in for a substantial period of time to see whether we're having an effect. And that would essentially be doing geoengineering itself. You can't do it on a small scale. You could fly a plane up there and dump some gas out and, and see what would happen at the nozzle. But to do a full scale experiment, we can't, uh, a, a small scale experiment, we couldn't do it. For example, if there's already a cloud there, we want to put gases in and see if the particles, we get more particles. You can't do that if there's not particles there already. We may just make the particles bigger. And so it's problematic whether we could actually ever do an experiment in the stratosphere without actually doing geoengineering. So I'd like to urge you to support a research program into the climatic response with climate models into the technology to see if it's possible to develop different systems so that we can make an informed decision in the future. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Robach. And Dr. Fleming, you're recognized. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Hall, and members of the Committee on Science and Technology. Uh, I want to talk about history. And uh, one of my epigraphs uh, is that in facing unprecedented challenges, which I think we are, uh, it's good to seek historical precedents. Uh, history matters, and informed policy decisions will, is going to, are going to require interdisciplinary, international, and intergenerational perspectives. So I applaud your international move, and I'd like to uh, uh, make a case for intergenerational uh, perspectives as well, informed by history. I was once asked when humans first began, uh, became uh, concerned about climate change, and I immediately responded, in the Pleistocene, that is, our whole history uh, comes out of uh, Ice Age uh, uh, variations of climate, and all of human history lies within the last uh, interglacial era, which is 12,000 years ago. We've experienced uh, huge variations in climate, up to 27 degrees Fahrenheit, and I'm sure the er early humans had important tribal councils, too, to talk about these things, although they didn't have mitigation yet as an option. European explorers and early American settlers were surprised that the New World was so much colder than the areas of the same latitude in Europe. For example, Washington, D.C. is on the same parallel as Lisbon, Portugal. Colonists worked to improve the climate by cutting the forest, tilling the soil, and draining the marshes. Benjamin Franklin thought this was possible. Thomas Jefferson thought it was actually happening. He called for an index of the American climate, which is one, rec one reason we have great weather records in this country, to document the changes being caused by human intervention. I'll show a few pictures. The quest to control nature, including the sky, is deeply rooted in the history of Western science. Some climate engineers claim they are the first generation to propose the deliberate manipulation of the planetary environment. But history says otherwise. In the 1830s, America's first national meteorologist, James Espy, who worked for the U.S. Army Surgeon General, advanced a large-scale engineering proposal to emulate, quote, artificial volcanoes. He proposed lighting huge fires each week. He preferred Sunday evenings. All along the Appalachian Mountains, each, each week he was going to make it rain and control and enhance the nation's rainfall. Espy argued that the heated updrafts would trigger rain and would not only eliminate droughts, but also temperature extremes and would render the air healthy by clearing it of miasmas. A popular writer at the time, Eliza Leslie, pointed out that manufactured weather control would generate more problems than it solved and would satisfy no one. This is 1842. This image of a technocrat pulling the levers of weather control appeared on the cover of Collier's magazine in 1954. We were in a weather control race with the Soviet Union at the time, and an Air Force general had just announced to the press that the nation that controls the weather will control the world. The magazine article inside by President Eisenhower's weather advisor, Harold Orville, provided detailed ways of conducting weather warfare. A year later, the noted Princeton mathematician, Johnny von Neumann, uh, in an article called Can We Survive Technology, wrote that climate control through managing solar radiation was not necessarily a rational undertaking. In his opinion, climate control could alter the entire globe, shatter the existing political order, merge each nation's affairs with those of every other, and lend itself to forms of warfare as yet unimagined. He compared climate control to the th threat of nuclear proliferation. Here Archimedes is acting as a geoengineer, and technology is his lever. But where is he standing, and where will the Earth roll if tipped? Geoengineering is not cheap, since we don't know the side effects. Quoting Ron Prynne of MIT, 
How do you engineer a system you don't understand? While some argue that we can control the temperature of the globe, ironically, at a recent NASA meeting on the topic of managing solar, a meeting coordinator apologized for not being able to control the temperature of the room. Think about it. <laughs> this is Hurricane King, 1947, when Project Cirrus intervened and seeded it. They wanted to announce to the press that they could control hurricanes, but basically they canceled the press conference when it came ashore and devastated uh, Savannah, Georgia. Other diplomatic disasters include Project Storm Fury in the 1960s, where Fidel Castro accused America of uh, cloud seeding over Cuba, and Vietnam, Operation Popeye, when the UN uh, subsequently outlawed hostile use of weather modification. People have said that climate control is not a good idea. Harry Wexler, the head of research at the Weather Bureau, said this in 1962. And just two years ago, Bert Berlin, the first chair of the IPCC, wrote, the political implications of geoengineering are largely impossible to assess, and it is not a viable solution because in most cases, it's an illusion to assume that all possible changes can be foreseen. Climate change is simple. We should do the right thing. Climate is complex. It uh, involves oceans and atmospheres, ice sheets, and now monsoons. So studying the human dimension is essential. We need the interdisciplinary, international, and intergenerational emphasis. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Dr. Fleming. At this point, we will begin the, round, the first round of questions, but first I would like to uh, give a premise. Uh, I, listening to, to, this, to the panel uh, makes me think that for most people, this is like coming in to the, uh, after the intermission uh, to Mr. Hall's uh, movie about the elephants, uh, and that we might want to give a little bit more of a premise, and I would would, would really advise anyone that has an interest in this issue to review the uh, Royal uh, uh, Society's uh, report. It's very good. I, I was thinking about giving Mr. Hall the, the two-page uh, summary, but I didn't want to overwhelm him. So, um, uh, uh, Professor Shepard would... <laughs> you know. You'd have had to read it to me. <laughs> uh, Professor Shepard, just quickly, would you sort of remind everyone about uh, the volcano uh, in uh, Pinatabo in 1991 and what happened? And I think it just, I think it, that's a good foundation for everyone to know. Uh, thank you. The volcano um, emitted... Uh, a, a large amount of sulfur dioxide, amongst other things, uh, some of which uh, made its way to the stratosphere. And uh, the result of this was the formation of a natural uh, sulfate-based aerosol that spread very rapidly uh, around the world and lasted for a couple of years, causing a fall in temperature of approximately uh, one degree Fahrenheit for uh, a couple of years. So uh, this gives us some... Uh, confidence that aerosols in the stratosphere do have a cooling effect and that the quantities of material required to do this are not unthinkably large. However, uh, volcanoes, of course, e emit uh, a lot of other stuff as well as uh, sulfur dioxide, and so they're, they're not a perfect analog. And one of the other issues in relation to... Well, I, I, just, wanted to, I just wanted to sort of point out that really nature has already given us somewhat of a, of a model, and this is not completely out of, out of line. Uh, I don't really understand him yet. <laughs> um, I'm going to give the panel some questions to take home with you, and I would like a you know, response later, but let's just start a discussion, with, and if we could today. Um, it, because if we're looking at a research program, I'd like to get a little better idea of what we should do. And so let me put out some questions for the panel and get some reaction. And again, I would like for you to take it back and, and, and respond to us uh, later. But what would, what would be the critical features of such a program? Uh, would there be just one coordinated program in the U.S.? Which U.S. agencies would have to be involved from the start and which would need to play a later role? What scale of investment would be necessary, both initially and in the long term? And what kind of expertise would be required? Uh, I'll later ask about the international implications, but uh, I'd like to get your thoughts on a research program here in the United States. Who wants to start? <clears throat> yes, sir, Dr. Fleming. I, I think based on what I said, uh, we'd have to have a lot more humanists involved, a lot more social science component. And I know that the National Academy has done uh, things, but it's the National Academy of Science. And so I'd like to uh, recommend that we, we 
go multi-agency, but include uh, not only technical outfits in the, in the discussion. Okay. Uh, uh, well, then we'll just go down the hall. Uh, uh, Professor uh, Shepard, and then Kadera, and then Lane, and then Lamar. Yes, I would uh, suggest that the program has to be uh, international and that it should not focus exclusively on one technology and specifically that it should not focus exclusively on solar radiation management because that is a technology which requires you to maintain your activity for as long as the greenhouse gases stay in the atmosphere, which is several centuries to a thousand years. And it's not clear that human society has the ability to sustain an activity on that time scale. So I think it would be very dangerous to start solar radiation management without having figured out your exit strategy, and your exit strategy would almost certainly include one or other of the carbon dioxide removal methods. So I would suggest that a small portfolio of methods of both of these types should be researched in parallel. Dr. Cadero. I would like to suggest that we should be thinking in terms of several research programs, each uh, multi-agency in character but led by different agencies. If we separate the solar radiation management proposals from the carbon dioxide removal proposals, I think the solar radiation management proposals, uh, the research should perhaps be led by NSF, possibly NASA. On the, the carbon dioxide removal approaches, again, can be divided into two major classes. Some are, are essentially growing plants and burying the organic carbon made by plants. We're, we already have some research programs into growing new forests and similar techniques, and those programs could perhaps be expanded to encompass a broader range of biologically based methods to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. The Department of Energy is already leading projects to remove carbon dioxide from gases coming out of power plants that those programs could be expanded to also consider removal of gases from the atmosphere. And so I think uh, there's at least three separate programs, and some of them might involve expansion of existing programs on the carbon dioxide removal side, but there's really no program at all on the solar radiation management side. And I, I personally would like to see NSF probably lead it, although NASA might make sense as well. Right, let's move to Mr. Lane. Um, I would suggest that is this on? Yes. Yeah. I would suggest that the solar radiation first of all, let me agree with Dr. Shepard that I think there ought to be research in both families, both uh, air capture and solar radiation management. However, uh, solar radiation management offers much larger economic payoffs potentially, and a much greater ability to reverse uh, rapid, highly destructive, uh, climate change should that occur. Therefore, I guess I would reverse uh, Dr. Shepard's judgment of priorities and say that of the two approaches, solar radiation management deserves more attention. And as Dr. Caldera has suggested, it's not really receiving any support from the U.S. government at this time. It is clearly the sort of problem that is going to require multiple agency inputs uh, and poses a very difficult organizational challenge for combining uh, science and engineering. I'm going to let everybody respond in writing later, but Mr. Robach, if you would maybe just quickly uh, close us. Uh, first of all, I'd like to mention that although the Pinatubo volcanic eruption cooled the planet, it also produced drought in Asia and Africa. It destroyed ozone, and it reduced solar radiation uh, generation from direct solar radiation by 30 percent in those technologies that we're developing. So it had, it's a lesson of e efficacy, but also of problems. I think research into solar radiation management needs to be done in a coordinated way internationally with climate models. The National Science Foundation should probably take the lead in the U.S. along with NOAA and NASA. There also needs to be a research program in the t into the technology. Can we actually get particles into the stratosphere? And probably NASA, the A is aeronautics, and the Department of Defense uh, might be looking into the technology of it, whether, it, whether it's possible. Uh, thank you. And now I yield to uh, uh, Mr. Hall for rebuttal. <laughs> I always come out second on that one when you're the chairman. You got the gavel. 
I'll be serious with you because I, I appreciate you and appreciate your background, the many years of study and the gifts you've made to this country and your very appearance here today makes me even more appreciative of you. And uh, I, uh, I especially, I, I like Dr. Shepard, uh, Professor Shepard, because uh, he at least uh, discussed global warming and he added the term cost to it. And that's what we can't get it, hardly anybody to talk about or who's going to pay it or how much... Uh, China's going to continue to pollute the world and, and not pay a dollar and increase it on an increasing ratio. So thank you for that. I, I agree with you on that. And I, I don't disagree with you on anything you've said. I just don't fully understand it. But he's given me the right to write you, and I'll, you'll be hearing from me. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Lane, uh, uh, you said uh, you advocate research and not deployment. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. And... Uh, uh, would you expand on your comment and your testimony that a steep decline in, gray, in greenhouse gas emissions may well cost more than the perceived value of the benefits? And let me say before that that uh, we had a study. I, I chaired uh, the, one of the committees one time when we were studying, and we studied uh, about uh, uh, asteroids. Uh, a, prof a professor told us about volcanoes, but we were studying asteroids and the danger and trying to get an international thrust on them. Uh, got no help on that because we had, a, a, I think, about a million five budget on that, and that was a couple of brain brilliant people and their, their, cl their workers, co-workers with them. But we learned during that hearing something that none of the group knew, including the chairman, uh, that was me, uh, that an asteroid just missed the Earth about 15 minutes in night, sometime in 1987 or 1988. So I think this is worthwhile. And I was just spoofing the chairman. He's so good-natured. He's the only chairman I can kid like that. But go ahead now and answer me if you would, uh, Dr. Lane. Dr. Lane. Yeah, yes, sir. Um, it, it seems that... Uh, the last 20 years has shown not only that it's difficult to get agreement on greenhouse gas controls, but that, that that's happening for very uh, clear reasons. China and India both have very rapidly growing emissions, and yet it's clear from the way their governments are dealing with the negotiations that they do not perceive greenhouse gas emissions reductions, at least not steep ones, is being in their national interests. And both of those countries are too powerful to coerce, and the costs of bribing them to reduce emissions when they don't feel that it's in their national interests are likely to be prohibitively high. I don't want to give the impression that I believe that we can go on emitting greenhouse gases at ever-increasing rates. I don't. I think eventually controls are going to be essential. But I really strongly believe that the, the conditions are not in place yet for a global agreement on significantly reducing em emissions. And until those condi conditions are in place, uh, there really isn't very much that the United States can do to change the global trajectory of emissions. Well, I thank you for that. And uh, also, I guess I'd ask you, your, your testimony seems to suggest at the time that, that it is R&D and not implementation. And uh, Are there entities, organizations, or countries that see an urgent need uh, for implementation versus a process of R&D? Uh, I, I know most of the, the really... Uh, rabid uh, advocates of, of global warming uh, mention everything with the cost and mention everything with the fact that China's, I think, every six days are spewing, uh, not using clean coal. And I think we'll fall back on coal one day. We're going to have to, but it has to be clean coal. But uh, uh, they, they're increasing, again, I say, on an increasing ratio, the damage to the earth without paying anything. And that goes for them. That goes for Russia. It goes for India. It goes for Mexico. And you could go on and on of those that want the benefits of the work that you probably all believe in but don't want to participate in the cost. One of the others of you made mention of that. 
I'll, I'll let you have whatever. I think I have maybe two seconds left, but if you can do your best to give. Uh, I do support R&D rather than deployment. Uh, Dr. Robach is absolutely right. We don't, we don't have the technology yet to do deployment, nor would it be prudent. For me personally, if I were going to put my bet on where to do R&D in the U.S. government, along with NSF uh, that Dr. Caldera mentioned, I would suggest that DARPA might have a role. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Hall. I, th I think we can, uh, can submit that unanimously that this panel would say that there should be no deployment, only research. I don't think you're going to find anybody that's going to disagree with that. Uh, Dr. Baird is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank our panelists. Uh, w roughly how much CO2 do human beings put into the air, anthropogenic CO2, on a daily basis? Anyone have an estimate of that or annual, if it, whatever numbers? Dr. Pellier? The average American puts out something like the average, their own average body weight each day in the form of carbon dioxide, so something like 150 pounds of CO2 per person per day in the United States. Times 300 million people. Right, times 365 days a year. Uh-huh. Mr. Robuck, did you want to add to that? The, the, the reason I ask the question is, is we are doing geoengineering on a massive scale. I mean, if, if 100 years ago somebody had said, hey, here's a bright idea, we should promote a plan to put that much carbon into the air, and Dr. Caldera, I commend you for mentioning ocean acidification, 25 percent of which will go into the oceans, make the oceans 30 percent more acidic within 50 years, and then continuing on after that to make it so acidic that it reaches levels not seen since the age of the dinosaurs and dissolve coral reefs. Shouldn't Congress support that? People would say, you're crazy. That geoengineering on that scale which is what we are doing, and now we're, we're looking at ways to reverse that. Uh, second observation would be, you know, years ago there was a psychologist named uh, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross who looked at what happens when people are dying, and not everybody goes through her stages of dying, which got a lot of play at the time, but nevertheless, her, her stages of dying went, you know, denial and then bargaining. And the bargaining tends to be, isn't there going to be someone to come rescue me from this cancer or this other illness that I've got? It strikes me that we're sort of in those stages now. And, and the reason I raise that in the context of geoengineering, we've had a whole series of hearings in my, my committee and this committee, or my subcommittee and this full committee, on carbon sequestration, on nuclear fusion, on geoengineering. And it seems to be everybody's trying to say, isn't there some way out there that we don't have to make changes in our behavior, that we can continue to pew, spew just as much CO2 or use just as much energy, and something somewhere is going to save us from just having to make these horrific changes like turning down our thermostat, putting air in our tires, etc. And so I applaud you all by, for suggesting that we're not going to have this deus ex machina rescue us by, you know, chemtrails or whatever people want to dis distribute into the air. There are some positive things that we could do. Uh, what would be the impact of simple things like changing the color of roof uh, uh, shingles or painting the rooftops? My rooftop here in town is black. It's a black rubber surface. It gets hot as blazes up there. I'm told we could make substantial differences in, in temperature and energy consumption. Not on the scale we need. It's not enough. But the point is, piece together the small stuff that doesn't require massive interventions. What are some of the things we could do? Actually, if we put solar panels on our roofs, that would be a much better way to respond because we would produce electricity from the sun, and that would uh, reduce the amount of CO2 emissions from other sources. And that would be much better than just painting the roofs white. It would cost a little bit more money to start with, but in the long run, it would be the best investment, and it would be a business opportunity. Why doesn't every new house have solar panels built into the shingles rather than retrofitting it like I did on my house thanks to subsidies from the state of New Jersey? So there are lots of, and there's lots of little things we can do, and they all add up to a mitigation plan. Let me, we focus mostly today so far on atmospheric and solar radiation management. What about in water? I mean, we're also geoengineering our water system. We're, we're putting hundreds of billions of pounds of effluent and, and fertilizers, et cetera, in the water. What are some positive, positive changes that we can do to agricultural practices, runoff practices, et cetera, that could help improve the, the quality of our water? Not 
you know, dumping clay into to, as a flocculent of, of uh, uh, algal blooms, but some positive things to reduce them from occurring to begin with. Do any of you have comments on that? Or are we mostly atmospheric today? I mean, you, you get the point I'm trying to make here, that we are, we, are, we are causing the problem through our own behavior, and then we're somehow going to try to fix the earth instead of fixing ourselves. If you had to summarize that, which would you say, because my time's running out, which would you say is easier, change our behavior or change the planet? Dr. Shepard? Well, you're, you're making it into a black and white choice, and my answer would be both. And uh, the problem is that there is an awful lot that we could uh, do in Europe, in the U.S., and in China, and everywhere to uh, reduce the impacts that we are having. But it, however hard we try, that may not be enough. So I think it's a mistake to make it black and white and say it's either or. I think we need to do both, and that may at some stage involve uh, geoengineering. Thank my you. time's expired. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Baird. And Dr. Bartlett, uh, yeah, I mean, excuse me, Dr. Elders is uh, recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the inter interesting inter uh, interaction we've just had. Um, I'm not quite sure what Mr. Baird meant when uh, he talked about fixing people. I know a lot of people fix their dogs and cats, but, <laughs> but on the other hand, that might be part of a good solution. Professor, do you remember the name of that woman that wrote that book? <laughs> no. Anyway, I, I'm hearing this discussion, I'm very much reminded of, of uh, Garrett Hardin, who's a great environmentalist, and uh, he had a statement which I framed and hung on my wall for a while. Uh, you, you can't do just one thing. And that's the heart of the issue we're facing here today. I think we have a lot of good ideas, a lot of things we might want to try. But you can't do just one thing, and almost everything you do has side effects. Some may be good, some may be bad. Frequently you don't know until you've tried it. And, and that's what's going to be the major impediment here as, as we proceed. Uh, the, there's also a public attitudinal problem that, uh, well, the best example I can give you, in the 1973 gas shortages when we had the big long gas lines and you know, I, I, as a physicist, I was very interested in people's attitude toward energy, and I felt we could do a much better job of conserving energy. The response of most people, even in talking to me, was say, well, we really don't have to worry about this. The scientists will come up with a solution. This intrinsic faith that science can solve uh, mammoth problems like that is, is not probably, well, it's nice they think that much of me, but uh, I don't think it's realistic. I think we have to, to face these problems in, in all of their dimensions. And uh, the point was made about China and India and what their attitude is going to be. Uh, as long as we continue the current economic behavior of this nation, we have no leverage in which to try to solve the environmental problems. I mean, well, how, how can we threaten the Chinese? Say, if you, if you don't do this for us, we're going to stop borrowing money from you. I mean, that, that doesn't, that's not an awful lot of leverage. <laughs> so I, I think uh, you have to keep all these factors in mind. I'm not in the least bit skeptical about uh, geoengineering. I, I think that's something we really have to investigate. I am skeptical about saying this is the answer to a major problem until we get some data, do some experiments, find out what works and what doesn't work. And above all, continue to recognize you can't do just one thing. And I, I remember very clearly, uh, I'm showing my age by this, but uh, in the era, era when everyone believed we could shoot silver iodide up into the atmosphere and make rain wherever we had a, a drought spot. And we seriously pursued this in some, some arid areas of our nation. Uh, found it just didn't work well because we have a lot of side effects we didn't anticipate. So this is a bit more of a sermon than a question, and uh, you're welcome, any of you who wish to, can uh, feel free to comment on this and how you think our nation and other nations can address this problem in a thoughtful, reasonable, meaningful way to try to come up with some solutions uh, of geoengineering that would work. Any comments? Yes, Dr. Kildare. I think you're correct in that we can't do just one thing and that 
I think everybody on the panel here believes that we need to eventually get to an energy system that does not use the atmosphere as a waste dump for our industrial products, but that there's a potential for some of these methods to reduce the risks that we're facing and reduce these risks cost effectively. And uh, the, while the panel disagrees about maybe the scale and scope of what a research program should be, I think it's, it's indicative that the entire panel asserts the need for a research program. And I would just also like to take this opportunity to support something Alan Robach said before when I was talking about the structure of research that on the solar radiation management side, there's an environmental science component that might be NSF, but there's another component about d developing and engineering hardware that might better fit in the agencies that Alan mentioned. Thank you. Dr. Robach. I'd just like to say that we can't hold geoengineering as a solution and allow that to reduce our push toward mitigation. It's never going to be a complete solution. We may need it in the event of an emergency, but let's not stop mitigation and wait and see if geoengineering would work. That's not the right strategy. Well, on that line, I think it would be very important for us to continue very strongly the approach of reducing our use of fossil fuels. I, for example, I've advocated for years that we try to move to solar shingles, that every house has to be built with solar shingles. We don't really need the, all these lights on in here either. No, we don't. <laughs> well, the cameras wouldn't work as well. Uh, Dr. <laughs> Ellers, if you don't, I, I, I'm going to be a little more strict because we're going to have um, votes, um, unfortunately, in a few minutes. So It's, it's uh, amazing how the clock runs so much faster when it's my time. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's Thank also you. moving up, not down. Thank you. Thank uh, uh, Dr. Griffiths, uh, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate this opportunity, and I do think the uh, initial discussions of this subject are important, even though we may not reach a conclusion. Uh, we, we do know we have a wide diversity here with the life expectancy of the male in China of 73 and the life expectancy of the male in India of 63, which points out a great, a great disparity in what the needs of the various countries are, and it makes it greatly difficult for a country like the U.S. Uh, that represents only 5 percent of the world's population to come to a conclusion or, or reach an agreement on how we should uh, approach or sell ourselves to the rest of the world. I guess if we included Germany, France, and England in that population group in Denmark, we may get up to 6 or 7 percent of the world's population. So it's a, it's a good subject, and it's certainly necessary. And uh, I appreciate each and every one of you being here, and I appreciate the chairman uh, bringing the subject up. I think this is a start, so thank you. Thank you, Dr. Griffiths. Um, Mr. Dr. Bartlett's not here right now. We'll, we'll recognize him when he gets here. So, Mr. Smith, you're up to bat. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I'll, I'll try to be brief. Uh, this is my third year here, and it, it's been interesting being on the science committee and trying to sift through uh, the science and, uh, you know, whether something is peer-reviewed, uh, whether it's not, and uh, the rejection of, of uh, recommendations that our, our science is peer-reviewed. Um, so it's been, uh, for this Nebraskan, uh, interesting and in how we might contribute, and especially as it relates to industry in my district. And uh, if any of you could speak to uh, the impact, uh, the, your perceived impact of uh, livestock industry, I've heard various uh, accusations. And if, if any of you would uh, care to comment on that. Uh I'm no expert on the livestock industry, but uh, I do know that one of the concerns with respect to li livestock uh, and global warming are methane emissions from livestock. And uh, I know that people are working on various ways of removing methane from gases that might be in barns or pens where livestock are held, and it, it might be potential for the kind of research to remove greenhouse gases from the atmosphere in general also to be applied to facilities uh, such as livestock pens or barns. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah, I'm, I'm involved with the University of Kansas in a group uh, that's doing this interdisciplinary inter, uh, graduate education. And uh, certainly it's, it's one of your neighbors. Uh, but. Uh, the group there is, is getting technical training in agricultural sciences as well as techniques to mitigate or 
perhaps reduce some of this. But part of the group's also looking at behavioral issues and choices and ways of, uh, of working together with the, with the, the industries uh, to, uh, to advance their, their purposes as well as uh, other, other goals. And so uh, the point I was making is that I think that the education we have often is in content and technique of science or techniques of engineering, but that social dimension is very important. And so looking at, uh, looking at issues like global warming and, and making uh, personal commitments and personal decisions I think is a very uh, significant aspect of this uh, program. It's not a solution to the beef issue, but uh, it, it, if smoking is bad for you uh, or, or beef is bad for the planet, uh, people have to make some decisions or, or alignments. Are you suggesting that beef is bad for the planet? No, but others have. It's been in the news recently. Well, I, I did read a, a comments of a writer one time who said that eating a T-bone steak is more egregious uh, to the environment than uh, driving a Hummer, per se. Um, I, I was astounded. Uh, you know, I'm not sure the nutritional values were considered, you know, in the... In the That's right. Yeah. Uh, in the bigger picture, but uh, certainly there's some concern, especially amidst this economy, that um, in, in uh, the so-called mitigating efforts, whether it's uh, cap and trade, uh, which is called a lot of other things, um, or whatever approach uh, we might take, uh, I, I hope that we remember that we need to look at the big picture uh, economically, uh, that uh, <laughs> There are some important factors here, uh, Dr. Caldera. You know, we don't not know how well these methods will work, these solar radiation methods will work at affecting regional climates, but th there's at least some possibility that as a result of climate change, weather conditions will change in America's heartland and that this will impact on the production of grain. And, uh, you know, I would be misleading you if I said, oh, well, I thought we could reverse this. But I think there's at least a potential that a research program with a relatively small investment could understand, you know, if the American heartland does turn into a dust bowl, is there a potential to change weather patterns to allow us to engage in agriculture once again? And, and, and so even if there's a small probability that this will occur, the investment is small, and so the expected benefit of this investment is very high. Mm -hmm. In my part of the country uh, that I represent, uh, we, we had an extended drought, and now we have uh, certainly a, a wet October. Is that wet October a result of, of uh, climate change and uh, carbon emissions? There's a lot of weather variability that because of the chaotic nature of the weather. So you can't attribute any drought or any flooding event to global warming. Uh, the probability of different weather events changes over time, but certainly that's just part of normal weather variability. Okay. But uh, cows do put a burden on the climate system. There's the methane emissions and there's all the energy used in the production of beef. And so that is one of the mitigation strategies is for people to eat less beef. And maybe there could be a a way for your constituents to gradually transition to other things that they could do that, that would be uh, emit less greenhouse gases. I'm sure that's the answer you wanted to hear, uh, Mr. Smith. <laughs> if only my time uh, had not expired. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. Uh, Ms. Cosmos is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, listen to uh, these gentlemen before us today and um, to suggest to uh, all of you here, I, I'm going to. I'm from Florida, and Kennedy Space Center is in my district, and so I'm really big on solar and sun, as well as NASA and space exploration. So my remarks will be focused for the for the most part on the solar radiation management. My remarks and questions, but I want to suggest to uh, my friend uh, Mr. Hall that um, while you might think this is science fiction, I was talking with my daughter yesterday, who was telling me my son, who is in China was saying that they had a massive snowstorm induced by the, the, the state of China, or the nation of China. Uh, so do, do you not believe that happened? You 
I believe that the snowstorm happened, but I don't think you can prove that they caused it. Okay. All right. Well, maybe it is science fiction. I don't know. But it, it is interesting, and I suspect if they could, they would. And so I, I think all the comments uh, mentioned today about the necessity for research and development and international cooperation in so doing are, are valid and, um, and worth um, – great consideration, that it is not impossible and maybe not even improbable that someone somewhere will ultimately uh, take advantage of the, of the scientific uh, opportunity. I would like to see us move forward with research and development, and I appreciate the comment of Dr. Shepard that, you know, be careful what you ask for because you're going to have to wind it down eventually. And uh, as you suggested uh, with the volcanoes, you need to know where you're going next. Nevertheless, I think in this Nation. We have uh, both the brains and the capability to uh, uh, move forward on new frontiers as this is. Mitigation, obviously, combined with uh, new opportunities for um, better ways to produce energy and also to protect the environment kind of seem like they go without saying. Um, in fact, one of the reasons that I ran for office is exactly that. I think we needed to be moving in a different direction in this country with regard to uh, protection of the environment and, uh, and conservation of energy and new energy methodology. So I'm pleased to be here and pleased to be on this committee. I wanted to just um, discuss uh, for a moment with Dr. Uh, Caldera. You uh, discussed uh, in your comments uh, – the simulations and small-scale field experiments of solar uh, radiation management. Can you d discuss what the simulations and the experiments entail? And, um, well, let's start with that. To date, there have been a number of modeling groups using climate models to simulate the effects of deflecting more sunlight away from, from the Earth. And I believe that... Uh, all of the simulations that used some reasonable amount of sunlight deflection found that sunlight deflection was able to reduce most of the climate change in most places most of the time. But as Alan Robach points out, after Mount Pinatubo, the Amazon and the Ganges River Delta had some of the lowest river flow on record. And so there are negative consequences we need to be aware of and to study more deeply. In terms of experiments, in the, so far no experiments have gone on in the field, uh, but we could think of process-based experiments. You know, if you did put some material into the stratosphere, what kind of chemical reactions would occur? Would the particles uh, stick together? And so, so there are a lot of field, small-scale field studies that could be done short of, of something that affects climate, uh, and, and we need to think carefully about how to go about conducting these experiments. Uh, okay. Um, I know that it has been suggested that the National Science Foundation and DARPA maybe would be agencies. Can you tell me um, something about your feeling of NASA being involved perhaps in these projects? Yes, sir. I'm sorry. Uh, we use a NASA climate model with NASA computers to do our simulations, and certainly NASA uh, should be heavily involved in the climate research and uh, uh, and. Also, NASA has put, puts up satellites, and we need a capability being able to measure particles in the stratosphere. There used to be this, the SAGE satellite, Stratospheric Aerosol and Gas Experiment. They no longer exist. There's a spare sitting on a shelf in Hampton, Virginia. Uh, we could... Well, we could bring it down to Kennedy Space Center, and I guarantee you we'd get it out there. <laughs> That's right. And so NASA really needs to be involved in an, in an enhanced <laughs> Earth observing uh, program that can really help us. I was here in Washington earlier this year at the National Academy of Sciences in a panel, are we ready for the next volcanic eruption? And the answer was no. And Jim Hansen was sitting next to me. He said, no, we need a better capability of being able to observe the stratosphere for a volcanic eruption and for any geoengineering experiments. And NASA could be heavily involved in that. Thank you, Ms. Cosmos. I think you're going to get some business down there. Oh, good. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, Mr. Robacher, Mr. Hall has been anxious, uh, waiting your uh, five minutes. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And no hearing like this would be uh, uh, fulfilled and without uh, my adding a list at this point of 100 uh, uh, top scientists from around the world who uh, 
are very skeptical of the fact that global warming exists at all. I would like to submit that for the record at this time. And uh, uh, there you go. Let me just note that uh, there is uh, uh, ample reason for us to uh, question whether or not things that are being suggested today are really needed because there's a reason to question whether there is global warming, uh, considering the fact that it has gotten, it has not gotten warmer for the last nine years and the Arctic polar cap is now refreezing uh, for the last two years. Uh, so, but that argument isn't what today's hearing is about, so I will just make sure that that's on the record and in people's mind when looking at some of these suggestions. Let me ask about some of the specific suggestions. Um, I have heard, I, I, have under, I understand that at 9-11 when they grounded all the airplanes, that it actually uh, increased the temperature of the planet. Global Is that right? And thus, uh, that, excuse me, that, that's not correct. Uh, it's not correct. There was one study that showed that without clouds uh, from contrails, that the d diurnal cycle of temperature went up. That the daily temperature went up, the nighttime temperature went down. But that was later disproven. It was shown that was just part of natural weather variability. So that wasn't a very. Let me note effect. that every time it doesn't fit into the global warming theory, it becomes natural variability. But when it does fit in, it becomes proof that there's global warming. Uh, uh, so uh, let me ask you this. So, th so we that that really wasn't then. Does anyone else have another opinion of vapor trails, by the way? So we have learned today that we really just have. And, and am I misreading you by suggesting that you two are part of the group that believes in global warming that would like to restrict uh, air travel or try to find ways of eliminating frequent flyer miles? We know you don't want us to eat steak now. Are we also not going to be able to fly in airplanes? Uh, airplanes are one of the sources of emissions. If they use biodiesel and it recycles the fuel, then it wouldn't be part of the problem. But indeed, uh, if we, we – we can do some emissions of CO2. We don't have to – these mobile transportation sources are very hard to retrofit on airplanes. With cars, you can, of course, generate electricity with wind and solar. But airplanes, we may still have to keep flying, and we can, we can live with a little bit of CO2 emission if we deal with other sources. Again, let me note that uh, – by the way, could – your scientist here, uh, what is the percentage of the atmosphere that's CO2? What percentage of the atmosphere? It's 0.039 percent. Okay. And most people, when I ask that question, Mr. Chairman, out in the hinterland, people believe it's 25 percent. And instead of this minuscule, that's 0.03, that is 3 percent of 1 percent and uh, of the atmosphere. And uh, there are those who uh, have realized that in, in the past there have been many times when that CO2 content was enormously greater. Was that, isn't that right? And during that time period there were lots of animals like dinosaurs and lots of things growing and the world seemed to be doing pretty good. CO2 concentrations were high in the past and uh, the biosphere flourished. And, you know, even if we disagree about what the threats are from climate change, and I think we do, that, uh, you know, I don't think my house is going to burn down, but I buy fire insurance. And but, but you don't tell your neighbor he can't have steak or visit his kids in an airliner. And that's no, the point. There's, 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 there's going to be changes. Right. People have to understand there are going to be huge changes in our lifestyle. No, no I, this I don't nonsense believe that. is accepted. I, I, I don't believe we're going to solve this problem by asking people to behave differently. Okay. I think we're going to solve it by improving the systems that 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 surround us. So, okay. so, uh, but but to get back to my point, that the uh, you know there even if we don't believe that climate change will damage us. We have to say there's some risk, and, and so then we have to say, well, how much should we invest uh, to, to uh, try to mitigate well, that risk? we're going broke right now, and the bottom line is, is that we have very little to invest in, in theories that may or may not be correct, 
and we also have a lot of indication that the, just the fact that you're using the word climate change is a difference than what was used 10 years ago, which was global warming. And most of us realize that's because uh, people now are, are trying to hedge their bets so they can have these controls, whatever way the temperature. No, I, I don't think but, that's true. Uh, uh, that, 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 uh, you know, time, time, Mr. Uh, um, the, Thank you very much. Yeah, Mr. Speaking of, of dinosaurs, the, the uh, time for Mr. Robacher has run out, <laughs> and we will uh, need to proceed to you, uh, Mr. Ms. Dow Kemper. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank um, our witnesses for coming today. Um, this is fascinating uh, hearing, and I look forward to more hearings on this as we delve into the subject further. I have a, a question for the panel and anyone who would like to address it. Do you believe that any um, particular geoengineering option should be removed from consideration completely? If so, why? Anyone? I, you know, I think we have to think in terms of, of a portfolio and that there are some things that are clearly more promising. Uh, there are some things that can be scaled up and on the solar radiation management side, there are things that can be scaled up and deployed rapidly. And, and I think those two are really particles in the stratosphere and perhaps whitening clouds over the ocean. On the carbon dioxide removal side, there are a bunch of uh, land-based uh, options to in increase the storage of carbon from photosynthesis that need to be explored, and also industrialized uh, capture of CO2 from the air and also spreading minerals around on the earth. Uh, my own view is that uh, other options, such as ocean fertilization, for example, are not going to play a significant role in solving the problem. That's not to say I wouldn't put, would put zero money into them. I would just put, put them way down in the list of my portfolio of investments. Anyone else? Dr. Rohrer? Uh, there's been a suggestion to put Frisbees in space to put a cloud of particles uh, of, of satellites up to block the sun at a point between the Earth and the sun, and that would probably cost trillions of dollars, and nobody's sure if it would work. So I wouldn't in, I wouldn't suggest we invest money in that idea. Uh, Dr. Shepard. Yeah, I, I would personally exclude from consideration the idea of covering desert areas with reflective material because of the potential uh, impacts on local rainfall patterns, not to mention the environmental impacts on the desert ecosystems themselves. Dr. Fleming. Given the hurricane I showed that came ashore, I would uh, also suggest we'd be very careful about redirecting storms. Oh, Dr. Caldera. I think we need to be clear what kind of research we're, we're considering. That if we're talking about a climate model and somebody wants to say, well, what would happen if we change the reflectivity of a desert in a climate model, that that's some, a small scale, non invasive kind of research that might uh, be good to do. But if somebody wants to start rolling out giant plastic sheets over the deserts, that's something we shouldn't do. So when I'm talking about a portfolio, there's some things that we should do at small scale, maybe just in climate models, uh, and that should re receive a relatively low priority. And I would say there's, there's nothing that we should do right now. We need a lot more research, mm -hmm. theoretical research with climate models to see what the benefits but also the risks would be of different suggested strategies. So far, everybody's done a different climate model experiment. It's hard to compare the results. So I'm organizing an international program where all the climate modeling groups in the world do exactly the same experiment so we can see do they really get drought in certain regions for certain experiments. And if everybody does the same experiment, we can compare it we'll have a much better confidence that our models are correct, just like we do for global warming experiments. If, if we're looking at this climate system being so complex, and you talked about some of the international um, agreements, what kind of things do we need in place in terms of international agreements and legal steps before we could really do a large-scale um, testing initiative? Dr. L or Mr. Lane? I guess I would pick up on uh, something that I, I um, said in my written statement, which, which is that uh, nations may differ in their interests uh, in geoengineering, at least in solar radiation management, which is the kind uh, we're talking about for the most part here. Um, I would suggest that the United States really needs to 
learn a lot more about the potential risks and benefits of solar radiation management for the U.S. before it embarks on any kind of international agreement or international protocol. Uh, we need to be clear on U.S. interests, uh, not that the, that ultimately isn't going to turn into uh, international bargaining, but just each country needs to be clear about its own interests before we're ready for diplomatic bargaining, I would suggest. Thank you, Mr. Thank Lane. You. And Thank demonstrate you. that the um, California Republican Party is a big tent. Uh, Mr. Bilbrey is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to uh, quickly uh, yield to the gentleman from the frozen wasteland of Nebraska at this time. I didn't realize that was a thank you, I guess. <laughs> no, sir. Um, Dr. Robach, following up on your suggestion that mitigating the consumption of beef would help the environment, um, do you see any nutritional drawbacks to that? Or do you consume beef yourself? Yes. Uh, and, no, I'm not an expert on nutrition or on uh, the entire system of, of agriculture. I've just seen papers that calculate how much greenhouse gases are emitted for say a pound of beef versus a pound of pork or a pound of chicken or a pound of potatoes and just in that one narrow way of looking at it there is more emitted that causes more global warming from beef. That but a narrow way of looking at it you're suggesting? Yes, yes. There's a lot of other considerations. I'm just talking about the impact on global warming. But you would, you would advocate mitigating consumption of beef as, as a means of accomplishing your objective? Uh, yes. And how would you suggest going about that? In, in the interest of time, I do want to leave him some time. How would you suggest going about that? Uh, education. I mean, people, uh, you can't, uh, I, I don't, I don't add, uh, I mean, it's your job to decide what to tax and what not to tax. Obviously, if you wanted to people to behave differently, you give them incentives and disincentives for behavior. But that's just one of the ways that the climate system responds to methane and it responds to carbon dioxide and the current way of producing beef emits a lot of those gases. That's just uh, w w what to do about it, what the entire portfolio of mitigation should be. Uh, I'm, uh, uh, I'm not... I'm oh, however, however it, I mean, you, you just uh, advocate for something to mitigate uh, the consumption of beef. Well, uh, <clears throat> so the way that if you, if you, if you do want to do that, of course, then you give... For the uh, record, I don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, you're, I guess I'm not trying, I'm trying not to say something that will make you feel bad, but I'm trying to also be honest about... about <laughs> a little too late. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Well, but thank you. Uh, Reclaiming my time, Mr. Very... Chairman, I have stated before, um, the changing, um, you know, quote-unquote lifestyles or whatever is, not, is going to be too little too late. Uh, I want to thank you for having this hearing. Um, uh, the fact is, after seeing what kind of proposal to, that supposedly was going to address climate change um, that came out of the political structure here, I've come to the conclusion that there is, we need to talk about mitigation of the crisis because we're not going to avoid it. The pol there's not the political will to do what it takes. There's not the political will even to make it legal in the United States to do what it takes to avoid climate change. And, and um, so because I believe strongly that we got to produce the, the, have the ability to produce energy um, that doesn't emit greenhouse gases so we can shut down all those facilities that do, and there's not the political will to do with that what we did with the interstate freeway system where the government went out and cited, did the planning, did the things so we can shut down the coal producing and the, the emissions and all that other stuff. We're not willing to do that. We're just willing to talk about how terrible it is. So this is going to be a treating the, the crisis and trying to mitigate the adverse impact and I and I appreciate that approach the question is there was a comment have we now um, eliminated global dimming as a consideration in this issue it, it, if by global dimming you mean the effect of pollution the cooling effect of particulates uh, part, in, the, in, in, the, in the in the troposphere uh, that's continu it, it's not global, but it's continuing in places that emit a lot of particles, like in India and China. But 
solar radi radiation mitigation is global dimming on a global scale. People are talking about putting a cloud in the stratosphere, not down near here where we, where we breathe. My concern is this, as somebody that's worked on air pollution. I would assume eliminating coal. I mean, safe, uh, clean coal is like safe cigarettes. I'm a hardcore against it, but we, that's fine. But if you, you eliminate coal, which puts a lot of particulates in, I'm concerned that it, there may be an adverse impact we don't consider. You got to co Yeah. If, if we eliminated coal use today, the earth would probably heat up by about another degree Fahrenheit from removing the sulfur. If we put just a few percent of that sulfur in the stratosphere, we'd get the same cooling effect on a global average without, with, while eliminating 90, something like 95 or more percent of the low-level pollution. And so we need to think about what if China were to say, for each power plant that we put sulfur scrubbers on, we'll take three or four percent of that sulfur and put it higher in the atmosphere to get that cooling effect while eliminating 95 or more percent of the pollution. Excuse me, Dr. Cordero. We, uh or have about eight minutes till we have to go vote. Uh, uh, so I just want to take a, a quick to, to, to assure uh, Mr. Smith that he can go home and tell his constituents that the beef police uh, will not be knocking on their door. Uh, and recognize Mr. Lujan to uh, conclude our uh, questions. Well, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate that. And as someone that enjoys a T-bone or a lamb chop, sometimes it's raised on the family farm that I live on. <laughs> I well and and home to a wonderful hunting in New Mexico as well that I'd invite my colleagues to come down to, to New Mexico to see for themselves. Um, I appreciate the emphasis with mitigation and what we're talking about here. Um, I would say that as we look to see what we have to do as a nation and what I hope that we're truly looking at here is not telling people they don't have to fly to visit their family or that they don't have to eat beef or that they don't have to do whatever it is that, that, that is being said today, but that we're telling people we can be smarter about the way that we do things. That we're saying, when we're talking about human behavior, um, I do not see how encouraging people to be more efficient with their home energy use or with vehicle use or being smarter about things like that, that that doesn't have a positive impact on all that we're looking at. Um, again, being smarter about the way we do things, being um, uh, able to embrace ingenuity and challenge our scientists, our engineers, our researchers to continue to do great things. Uh, you know, when, when I was young, I, I remember watching cartoons about science fiction and this whole notion that people could one day be in space, building a space station, um, uh, not only walking on the moon, but staying up there for months upon end to do research. And lo and behold, yesterday there were three astronauts that came to visit us here on Capitol Hill who came back from making improvements where there's more and more people that are living in space, staying there for months upon end. We're in a global community. We're doing some of these things that were once considered science fiction. We're being smarter about the way we do things, and we're doing them better. And so as we look to see what is happening around the earth, I know that there are many who truly believe that there still isn't a problem, that this isn't something that we have to do something about. And I would hope that we could get something submitted into the record from, um, from, from those of you that are willing to, to speak to them, to tell us what it is that we can share with them as well, to talk about this problem that I believe that is facing us as a nation and facing us as a global community. As we talk about the science, though, and what it indeed that we can employ to be more aware of what is actually occurring with the warming of the oceans or weather patterns. Can you talk about the importance of how we're able to include computer modeling capabilities of research laboratories, of our national laboratories, of our colleges and our universities around the United States that have supercomputing capabilities and have the ability to now use new data to be able to feed you the information that you need so we can indeed solve some of these problems? Dr. Caldera? I uh, and my colleagues did some of the first computer model simulations of these solar radiation management methods at a the Department of Energy National Lab, Lawrence Livermore Lab, and the kind of computing facilities at places like Los Alamos and, and uh, the other labs in the system are really valuable and were a great place to be able to do this work. Uh, you know, that I'm also, a, as an academic, a strong supporter of 
our academic research institutions and the computing facilities at those institutions. And I think that there is potential through investing in this research area to revitalize our science education and the computing facilities that support that education. Dr. Kadera, and, and for the rest of the panel, we're down to less yes. than five minutes now. So I will quote, uh, if, I, if, if he doesn't mind, Dr. Ehlers uh, in saying, Mr. Luhan, you uh, brought us to an eloquent conclusion. Thank you for, for your statement. Um, uh, before we close uh, the hearing, I, as I told the witnesses earlier, I will pr pr provide for them a, a, a two questions. One on a re what should a research program look like, and the second one, uh, if we have any type of international uh, treaties or collaboration, what should that look at? We would also welcome any comments uh, to follow up, Mr. Lujan, or, or anything else. You have been an, an excellent panel. Uh, this has been a a, uh, I think an important hearing, the start of a longer term uh, discussion. Um, and I think that we can say with consensus uh, that no one is advocating uh, that geoengineering uh, is a one stop shop uh, uh, or any type of a um, alternative uh, to um, uh, mitigation, uh, but something that needs to be reviewed. And so I will say now that the record will remain open for two weeks for additional statements from members and for answers to any follow-up questions the committee might ask witnesses. The witnesses are excused, and the hearing is adjourned. Thank you. How far apart does Dana and Bilby live? Um.